Hello, I'm Jackie Marchington, Director of Global Operations at Cordex, which is part of McCann Health Medical Communications. Uh, first of all, some disclosures. As I said, I'm an employee of Cordex, um, which provides services I'm going to talk about to clients. The contents of this presentation do represent the, my, uh, my views of my employer because it's about best practice, so it should. And also, I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors who are listed here. So what am I presenting? What's all this about? Not so long ago, actually quite a while ago, um, 2015 GPP3 came out and at a meeting very much like this one, Liz Wager came and spoke to us about the changes that had happened between GPP2 and GPP3, which were great, but they didn't, still didn't really address issues that were peculiar to abstract preparation and presentations. All the language in GPP3 was about journal or congress, if so, tying up publications with presentations. There are very few specific uh, points on the board you can see here. Um, and there's, a, there's one thing about encore presentations um, talking about addition and removal of authors. So we kind of felt it wasn't really addressing the issues that are really specific um, and make people who's, who work in agencies' lives very difficult on occasion. Um, specifically, the unanswered questions are still mainly around authorship around approvals and translations, uh, some issues around copyright, encores, whether you should, whether you shouldn't, too many to count. So we kind of thought we needed to do something about it and decided a group of us who are at the meeting and a few other people we invited to be involved um, could take this forward and create a guideline which we thought would be helpful. So having just been at a meeting about GPP3, we were very GPP3 compliant. Um, we had a kickoff TC amongst all the authors, and we brainstormed and identified the issues we still felt were unresolved. Um, we put an outline together and circulated it for comments amongst ourselves. We all picked our favourite parts to work on. I ended up with copyright, bizarrely, but never mind. Um, so we all uh, went away and worked in small groups on our own, on our sections, brought it all back together, realised there were still some holes in it. So we patched the holes and then um, put it into a manuscript format, which we then posted as a preprint to PeerJ for an external comment. Because although we'd had a mixture of agency and industry people involved in developing the manuscript, we wanted to, to seek wider input. Um, so we thought preprints were the way to go with that, um, which was very useful. So we had a fair bit of feedback on, on PeerJ, which we then tabulated, had a great author meeting, we thrashed through it all um, and made revisions according to the feedback we'd had. Um, we then submitted the manuscript to um, Research Integrity and Peer Review, or RIPA, as it's known to its friends, um, where it, I think it's fair to say it, it, it dwelled in peer review for some time. Um, but after seven months, we did get our peer review comments. Um, we had an author meeting to address them. We had one blind peer reviewer and one uh, open peer reviewer at the time. Um, so we addressed all the comments. We rebutted some of the comments resubmitted it and finally had it accepted. Not quite in time for ISMAP this year, sadly. Um, but we did, get, um, we did get it out this, I suppose, June is spring. Uh, since launch, we were very pleased. It's had good reception from uh, august bodies like the UK Research Integrity Office on Twitter. Um, and even the Peer Review Congress retweeted something, but I suspect it's because Liz tweeted it rather than anybody else. Um, we had over 1,500 accesses in the first three weeks. This slide's now out of date. We're over 4,500 accesses in total. Um, so it's been quite well received, we believe, and actually has been serialised in Twitter format by a company called Chirico, who I know nothing about, but thank you very much for the publicity. So what is it? What do we actually cover? What do we get into the guidelines in the end? Ah, not guidelines, recommendations. That's one of our peer review comments. Um, possibly because Liz was involved, we decided to structure it very similarly to GPP-3. Um, so there's an introduction, a little bit about the methodology, which is again came from our peer review comments. Um, and we then state the principles around good practice for conference abstracts and presentations, and then some specific recommendations which are in numbered sections. There is some repetition which is deliberate. Um, the idea is that they are handy dandy, I can use it uh, to help me in my day job. Um, recommendations so you can skip to the section you want and not fear you've had to read linearly through the entire paper to get everything. Mind you, it is a good read if you want to read it linearly, not a problem. So the principles um, we outlined, there are six principles, uh, at a very high level, I'm just summarising them in this presentation. Um, they're around authorship, um, acknowledging the practical limitations of working with presentations, um, availability of authors and language skills of authors. 
Um, around author contributions, again, practically how much um, intellectual input could you put into 250 words? Um, and, and about transparency as well, we, we have the expectation that the, the transparency around an abstract should be no less than that of a full manuscript. Um, so we talk about contributors versus authors, um, study linkage, discovery is most important after all. Um, transparency about funding closures and conflict of interests and of course the use of medical writers. So they're the principles. Now this, that was really about agency and industry folk, I suppose. But quite a lot of our day job is uh, confused by conference organisers. So we did try to offer some advice to conference organisers. And we suggested that they should do these things. They should uh, inclu encourage inclusions of contributor lists, uh, include a field for uh, trial registration, uh, sponsor information, disclosure of writing, report, writing support, um, encourage them to use ORCIDs because they're really useful for, for identifying authors, not set limits for the number of authors, which is something which some congresses, you know, you, you shall have no more than six authors. Well, why? I've got eight, and they did all did the work, um, that kind of thing. And also, we wanted a clear distinction between um, authors, bona fide authors who meet the ICMG criteria, and additional individuals who may have been drafted in to perhaps present in, in an, uh, another language, um, or a substitute presenter uh, due to non-attendance and that kind of thing. So these are the things we asked the conf conference organisers to consider. We did circulate the recommendations to 67 learning societies and uh, events companies. We had a response from one. You'd be glad to know, though, all the blue ones, we asked to have a field on the submission site so it doesn't actually affect the word count. So don't panic, we'll still have 250 words to play with. One of our uh, reviewers suggested that our manuscript could benefit from a figure or two. So the lovely Liz ran off and developed a roadmap which guides you through from start to finish. I don't expect you to have to read this, by the way. Read the paper. Um, from initially identifying the authors through to um, presenting the work and persistence of the work beyond the original presentation. And it's linked to each of the sections in, this, in the recommendations so you can find what you want relatively easily. So, what are the recommendations? We had uh, six sections, and I'm going to have a slide per section. The first is about authorship, and these are really the takeaways. So we encourage people to follow ICMG JE as far as possible, um, but you have to recognise there's a limited amount of input people can put into a 250-word abstract, and it's perhaps one of the, the occasions where that's fine. I have no comments, is actually acceptable. We do expect all named authors to review at least once, not necessarily every round, um, and approve the final content. Um, if we use translators, um, we should acknowledge them um, versus a local language presenter, which is not quite the same. By this we mean people who are being asked to approve um, an abstract in their non-native language can use the assistance of a translator to help them understand the content. There's guidance about what to do when your lead authors don't really want to be involved anymore, and that's really to do around encores. Um, and we also support company authors' rights to present. They're an author because they fulfil the criteria, therefore they should not be penalised by not being allowed to present work. We also talk about local presenters when a sponsoring society um, requires an, an author to be a member of the society and non-author presenters. Um, and we have a second uh, figure about that. And in hindsight, perhaps not quite as helpful as we thought it might have been. Uh, but all of that is covered in quite a lot of detail. And it's, I think, the longest section of the entire um, uh, manuscript. We then go on to talk about abstracts. Um, and from the previous slide about conference organisers, you'll see it's basically a plea to not make us waste word count on administrative details, please. Um, we do encourage the inclusion of study IDs and funding statements. We point out that word counts aren't always a con uh, compatible with consort requirements for abstracts, and we would really like to have more space, please, if you can. Um, we touch briefly at this point on post-publication encores. Um, once a paper has been fully published, we believe that encoring an abstract is redundant. Um, and the last piece is really about anybody who's ever had the pleasure of submitting uh, on a one-hit wonder submission site where you have, what, you have to sit down and do everything in one sitting. Um, and the other one is where authors are asked to insert their own disclosure details. And the li likelihood of getting all of your authors to actually do that in a timely fashion is just not going to happen. So some, um, again, some pleading with the conference organisers about that. 
When it comes on to presentations, and by presentations we mean collectively posters and abstracts, um, this is a, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard this, uh, titles and authors should match a submitted abstract. Uh, if you have a disappearing author, somebody who, who was uh, willing to be involved in the abstract but cannot now be involved in the poster, a footnote is sufficient. Study IDs, funding statements should be included on in the presentation, whether it be on a slide or on the poster. Um, again, we encourage author review and approval of each, uh, um, at least one review and approval of the final content. Uh, explain that no major changes should be made after all author approval. You know, that lovely moment on site when your speaker changes everything at the rehearsal. Um, and if you can't talk them out of it, that finalised version that was presented should then be circulated to the other uh, authors. Um, if the data change between the abstract and the presentation, which yeah, it does from time to time, if it's a minor change, it doesn't really impact the um, results, we suggest to add a footnote. If it's a major change, we suggest to alert the Congress. This could be for two reasons. You could have had a platform presentation because there are really interesting results which are no longer interesting. Um, or you could have, could have had a poster presentation because there are quite straightforward results which are now really interesting. But either way, um, the Congress should be notified so they could potentially change your uh, presentation format if they wanted to. And again, full disclosure of writing and design support um, for posters and, um, and slides. Specifically for posters, um, it's the, 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 the standard things. Consider whether a poster posted online may uh, jeopardise full publication. Posters are not peer-reviewed, so if you must cite it, only do so until the full publication is out. And we have a section about citation as well. Um, poster presenters should ideally be agreed before abstract submission, um, but plans change, people miss planes, what have you. Um, we have a section about alternative presenters in, in the authorship section. Um, we also suggest, we've, I know we asked everyone to put a lot of things on posters uh, about disclosures and funding sources and conflicts of interest, what have you. There isn't room, um, consider using a QR code to, um, to, to, to put the key information on the poster and consider using a QR code to link to the other information. Um, another thing is um, about persistence of online material. So, some pharma companies only allow their materials to be accessed during the Congress. Um, some, if you control your own platform for hosting your posters and, and what have you, you can uh, take them down as you wish. Um, we suggest, and this is perhaps something we didn't quite get strongly in the manuscripts I wanted, um, that online content should come down once the full publication is out, or at least be watermarked as fully published elsewhere, so people don't persist on using that poster or that oral presentation. Speaking of oral presentations, again, presenters should be agreed before submission um, and acknowledging plans can change, same as previously. If you have to change presenters, we suggest the originally uh, intended presenter should brief their, their substitute. Again, identification of people who are non-author presenters. Um, consider whether recorded presentations um, posted online present the same issues as online posters. There's a uh, quite recent COPE case on this actually about recording of an, on, an oral presentation and COPE don't consider it um, either copyright infringement, which is great, or um, prior publication to have a recorded, a recorded presentation. Um, same persistence issues uh, and the, we, we go touch on um, when the speaker changes at all at the rehearsal uh, in section one. Encores was fun, we enjoyed doing encores. Um, the thrust of it is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, we have a checklist to consider when you should be thinking about an encore or when you shouldn't be thinking about an encore. Um, we suggest they should be clearly identified as such on the submission to the new, uh, to the new meeting um, and on the poster or the oral um, as well. Uh, we have some suggestions which have drawn some interesting debates uh, internally um, about, about when an encore isn't an encore. Um, basically, just rewriting it, change the words around to avoid copyright infringement, what have you, don't. If it's a genuinely new manu um, abstract, then that's fine, or poster, that's fine. If you're just updating an existing data set, it's an update. If you're adding new data, it's a different data set, you're interpreting it differently, then it's not an encore. But that, that conversation will continue for many years to come, I expect. Then my favourite section, copyright section. Um, we encourage everyone to read the licensing agreement during the submission uh, to see what you're actually giving away. And it's important to read it during submission because when you submit your abstract and you get accepted, by the time your acceptance comes through, the submission site will probably be closed and you won't be able to find out what you signed up to. So read the small print to see whether you're signing off 
uh, on, a, on a copyright transfer, on a license to publish, on an abstract, or everything derived from that abstract. It's important to know. Um, copyright in a presentation resides with the authors, unless you've explicitly, explicitly signed it over as part of your um, uh, author agreement, which I've never seen. Um, but if you're considering doing lots of encores from a presentation, um, it may be worth getting agreement up front from the authors to be able to encore that material without having to go back to them every time if they're not going to be involved in every encore. Um, and again, be mindful of third-party material in, in, uh, in encores because you will need to um, seek permission for each usage. We again suggest to conferences if they do require a license or usage rights to consider Creative Commons licensing. Um, and as I say, don't try rewriting what would otherwise be a, a, an encore to avoid the requirement for copyright permission. Um, we've closed, the final section is about citations. Okay, so um, we would encourage readers to not to use conference presentations as citations. The abstract is usually what's published in the abstract book. Presentations are not peer reviewed. Um, this was a, an interesting uh, point of debate with our blinded reviewer who turned out to be a journal editor. Um, and trying to explain that the abstracts weren't abstracts in papers, they were abstracts that were presented to meetings, so they weren't peer-reviewed, they were screened by a scientific committee. Um, as I said, the abstract's published, the poster isn't, so consider what's publicly available. Um, if you do find um, something doesn't make it into your paper that was on a poster, it may be worth putting that um, extra result in as a um, supplementary material, so you don't have to keep citing both the paper and the poster. So that's a very top line summary. Um, what next? We'd like people to join in, please. We have a website. Uh, if you have any comments, cases, interesting conundrums, um, please use the contact form on the website to let us know. Um, you can ask us on Twitter, which we, we quite like. So if you use the hashtag GPCAP, please do not hyphenate it. We will see lots of photographs of Lewis Hamilton wearing baseball caps. Um, on the website, we have some additional references around the subject. We're curating some best practice resources for developing posters um, and uh, visually attractive posters, as opposed to the things we sometimes end up having to present. And we want you to use it. We want you to use it with clients. We want you to use it with your colleagues. We want you to use it with authors. Um, we'd like it tested out real-life scenarios, and we'd like the feedback, please, so we can then think about GPCAT2 at some point in the future, and maybe some people present have some ideas and would like to be involved going forward. Finally, um, thank you to uh, Medcoms Networking Brunches for kicking this off and happening and having us back to talk about it. Thank you.